When you look at the factors that make good learning for uh, dyslexic children or children with other um, difficulties or barriers to their learning, it's actually just good teaching. It's good practice for all. If you're going to be inclusive, that by its nature is, is everybody, isn't it? And what we found is by putting in those measures that make children, dyslexic children, non-dyslexic children, independent, you're actually increasing you know, the benefit for everybody. Were there barriers to introducing those measures? Uh, only as I say, people say, well, why is this a priority? But you had to kind of point out, you know, how many, we maybe only have four or five children who are officially diagnosed as dyslexic, so why is this the biggest priority? But I think once CPD had gone through and training, gone through and ex explaining to teachers that actually what suits, you know, this is just good teaching and what suits maybe this four or five children will actually improve things for a whole raft of other children who maybe have specific tendencies, maybe don't have a diagnosis, or, or actually just want something given to them in a slightly different way. It's just something that we took on board. And working in a flexible way like this allows you to be very responsive to the needs of all children. Do you need to steal anybody's? Yeah. Oh, he's stolen yours. You're 28, What do you think were the most critical things that you put in place so that you become SEND friendly? Um, as I say, I think first of all it's about realising it's just good quality teaching. It's not necessarily for one specific group of children, it's making it accessible to all children. We do have small group teaching, we encourage independent learning, but most of all we encourage that attitude in the children themselves of they have an ownership of their learning, they've got a responsibility for their own learning. They can't just sit there and be passive receivers of learning and sit there with their mouths open like a baby bird waiting to be taught. They have to be active participants in it and that goes for all our learners from those that have um, but may have been categorised as most able to those that have got real specific barriers to their learning. Um, they all have to have active engagement in it and so giving children um, that responsibility um, get, making sure that they have a language, a shared language for learning so that themselves and the adults in the room can all talk about what it is they do well, what, what are the skills of learning that they need to improve upon to, to be able to do better. All our children from the youngest up are able to do that. Um, taking responsibility for things like um, reporting to parents, um, writing their end of year reports, and parents' evenings, um, peer feedback, all of that stuff means that actually, you know, it's your learning, take responsibility for it. Um, but understand that it's not going to be easy. How do you go about identifying the areas where there needs to be improvement and how do you go about then effecting the change? Across the school. So, obviously, uh, as a leadership team, as a wide leadership team, we we will be monitoring, we will be looking for the things that we say are in place, that we would like to be in place, are actually in place. Sometimes that's in response to data, internal data. Sometimes that will be in response to local or national change, um, a new piece of legislation or a new requirement. You know, is that in place in our school? And so it's monitoring and, you know, lesson observations and book looks and talking to children and talking to teachers, all those kind of things give us a measure of how successful we're being um, with the things that we've decided as part of our vision, as part of our, um, as our goals and our, our priorities in the school improvement plan are the things that we're going to be working towards. Not everybody likes change. No. <laughs> Have you met much resistance along the way with all the various measures and things that you've put in place? Um, I think there's a lot of change in teaching um, and so it's understandable when people would say, oh, you know, I just need to just leave me alone for a minute and let me do, do something uh, for a while. But I think as long as there is good explanation as to why it's being done, we, all of our teachers take part in action research um, and lesson study as part of their performance management. So we're actively encouraging them to be agents of change themselves. So asking questions all the time, you know, if I do this, will the children do that, for instance? 
um, and how can we improve practice in our own rooms um, and then spread that out to the rest of the school. So I think as long as people see good reason for change and as long as leadership to the best of their ability can um, give that message but also um, assure them that then we're not going to be you know, flip-flopping back again the next week. It's, it's you know, there's a, there's a course there, there's a journey that we're going on. Um, people have mostly been very supportive of, of the road that we're travelling on and, and understand why. I mean, we want them to be part of the change themselves. What tips would you give to someone in your position who needs to motivate staff to get the support and, yeah. and make the changes happen? So I think it is really about selling the vision, having a very clear vision yourself. You don't necessarily need to know where that vision is going to end up. You know, when we set out on the journeys of developing our curriculum maybe seven or eight years ago now, we didn't envisage these open zones. But it became the logical next step at a certain point. So you don't have to be clear about the end place for that vision. You just have to be clear about the next step um, and, and to see where that takes you. So selling that to staff with lots of CPD, lots of training, um, often that training is even better coming from someone from outside, you know, get, get a great speaker in to say exactly the same things you would have done often goes down far well, far better with, um, with staff. Um, and also be, be mindful of what else you're asking staff to do, um, that it's not just becomes an add-on. I think leaders have got to be um, just as happy about taking say no to things and say no we're not that actually doesn't fit our philosophy we're not going to get on that bandwagon or we don't need this at this time so saying no to certain things that you don't think are going to help um, whilst at the same time uh, adopting the things that that are true to your vision and will take you on the journey that, that in the direction you're going what do you believe to be the key features of a school that is SEND, SPLD, neurodiversity friendly? Um, I think when you, hopefully it would be something like our school, and when you walk around our school, what you see are uh, collaborative environments. We talk about learning communities a lot in our school and that we're all learning together. You see spaces where children aren't frightened to write their ideas big on the wall, for instance, or all across the table for everyone to see. And they know that if they make a mistake, they're not going to get mocked for that. So I think we have to spend a lot of time celebrating struggle with children, getting that message over that everybody is going to meet failure, everyone is going to meet barriers, and that it's about how you help yourself over those barriers. So depersonalising the failure. The failure hasn't got anything to do with you. It's about the approach that you took and it's about um, how you can get better at it next time. So giving all children the skills to help themselves and feel safe to struggle in a learning community. What do you think are the benefits of a whole school, SEND, SPLD, neurodiversity friendly school? Mm. I think it's when you in charge of a school, you want the whole community to succeed, don't you? You have responsibility for 100% of those children. And so we want a successful learning community for everybody. And everybody is going to, whether they have a diagnosis or a, a label of something or they come with extra this or extra that, it doesn't matter. Everybody is going to meet difficulty and struggle at some point in their lives. And so we want, we're trying to equip children, of course, to be literate and numerate, but actually our journey for the last seven or eight years has been far wider than that. We, we're after the, and what else? You know, what, what do these children need when they leave us to be able to be successful in the future? Not just the secondary school, but actually the qualities that are going to take them through to be successful in the rest of their lives. Um, so yes, of course, we want high standards of literacy and numeracy, but we also want qualities of, um, of personality that means that you are resilient to, to failure. You are up for a challenge. You're not going to collapse as soon as something gets tough for you because you realise it's part of part of life. Um, you know about the power of collaborating and teamwork and that you are skilled within that. Um, and so, you know, when, when you see 
job ads out there. Um, that tends to be what employers ask for, isn't it? They, they, they will assume as well that literacy and numeracy is, is taken for red. Actually, we want those qualities that are going to um, take people through and, and be successful um, with them for the rest of their lives. Is there a benefit for the staff too? We've tried to take the same attitude with our, with our staff as we do with our children. So we give our children lots of choice, lots of um, freedom to make decisions about certain things, um, and we judge them by their, by their outcomes. Yeah, you know, they, they have the choice of sitting with their friends, sitting with somebody else, sitting on a chair, sitting on the floor, whatever they can choose, what order they're going to do the work in, they can make all those choices, but they don't have a choice about um, the the quality of the work and the time it's going to be done by. Yeah, so we make the same deal with our staff. Our staff are professionals and I think our journey for the last 10 years has been very much about building that professional ethos back with our staff so that they have a lot of choice about how they work, the way they deliver things, make decisions about how things are presented to children. But we expect the high outcomes and we expect them by a certain time. Um, so I think our teachers like to work like this. Um, I think it's fair to say not everyone can immediately see themselves working in an open zone when they first see one, but none of the teachers that have got into the open zones want to come out, so I take that as a good sign. Um, I think they like the collaboration as well. They like the teamwork, um, but they also like the opportunity to see, see real learning happen you know, in that small group session, they like the opportunity to be flexible and responsive um, with children. Um, and they like the chance to push the learning on with children as far as, as, far as they can go. Um, so I think that that's the sort of things teachers tell me, that it's, it's enormously supportive as well for, um, for inexperienced teachers, young teachers coming to the profession, because obviously they're... Um, working closely with colleagues, they're marking each other's books, they're learning from experienced professionals. And I think that's tremendously supportive for, for young teachers as well. So, you know, we, we see that as a benefit hugely. What do you think needs to be done to improve awareness and acceptance of the term neurodiversity going forward? OK. So I think it's just acknowledging that everybody has different needs and at different times and that everybody learns differently everybody appreciates um, will, will appreciate things presented to them in a different way sometimes um, there will be some areas that uh, children and adults as learners grasp very quickly and there'll be other other areas that they, they'll need it presented to them differently so I think it's just acknowledging that actually everybody uh, would benefit from an approach that says, you know, we're all different, that we all come up against the same uh, problems with learning sometimes, um, and that it's not about being, you know, super intelligent and getting everything really quickly. Learning is challenge. Um, we all should expect to, to meet difficulty if we're going to learn. Um, and I think if we all are open to that, we all realise that actually if things come to us too easy, we've probably not learnt anything. Um, it's, it's accepting of everybody. What, in your view, then, are the three most essential characteristics of a successful school leader? OK. Um, so I think, I think at this school, the leadership is good at questioning questioning what we do and why we do it, um, asking if there's a better way, asking if there's a, a way to do things differently that can achieve more of what we want. Um, I think as well, um, to, uh, leaders have to be good at allowing staff to strip away certain things as well, not just to add on everything new as, a, as an additional thing, um, but that some things aren't necessary for us anymore, they're not helping us on our journey, let's take that, in fact, it may, they may even be hindering us, so let's strip that away. So being brave enough to say no to certain things too, um, to protect, protect the staff. Um, and I think as well, a, a willingness to keep learning and 
and appreciating the importance of continuing CPD and research um, for leaders as well as, as for staff so that we are, we never settle for where we are um, because we're always going to be asking well what next then and, and you know as I said you know our children will constantly surprise us but only if we let them and if our children have surprised us with one thing it should lead us to ask the question well what else can they do then so we will never actually arrive at the point at which we say well that's it we've built the perfect school because every success should only just get us to ask well what else can we, we achieve. Mm -hmm.